Welcome to A Friend of Mine, a series of conversations with some incredible and inspiring women in business from regional and rural Australia. I'm Kimberly Finesse, your host and the founder and editor of Oak Magazine, and I cannot wait to introduce you to some amazing female entrepreneurs who will share with you their experience and knowledge of what it takes to start, grow and scale a successful business. So let me introduce you to a friend of mine. In 2017, Queensland artist and curator Kara Ann Simpson spent almost a year in hospital with a severe brain infection. She was later diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and neurosarcoidosis. Kara Ann had to relearn to walk and speak clearly. Creativity gave her back a sense of belonging. At the rehab centre, Kara Ann's partner would take her into the gardens where she would pick flowers and then arrange them in plastic cups back in her room. This was the beginning of her way back to art practice and of regaining hope for a future. The practice followed her home and grew into the in-person and online exhibition, Fuari Flores, Latin for Stealing Flowers. In this episode, Cara Ann shares with us her childhood, the challenges and opportunities in pursuing a career as a professional artist, her health journey and its impact on her art, and her latest multi-sensory exhibition, Fuari Flores. Cara Ann also gives us a little insight into living in a converted shearing shed. Meet my friend, Cara Ann. Hello, Cara Ann, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Kimberly. An absolute pleasure. I'm in Bendigo, Victoria. You are in Hayden, which is near Toowoomba, Queensland. Tell me a little bit about today. If you looked out your window, what are you looking at? Uh, well, I live on the lands of the Jarrawa people of the Waka Waka Nation, and where I live is my family farm and out the window of my studio is a beautiful paddock that meets eucalyptus forest. Lots of rolling hills. It is really spectacular up here. Your view sounds so much better than mine. <laughs> I, look, there's a house built next door to mine and, yeah, their trees are overgrowing. So my look out the window isn't as lovely, but I must say, I mean, we're in, what, midsummer, uh, and it's raining today. So, yeah, just the uh, the weather doing weird things at the moment, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is. It's really strange up here as well. Mm. And of course, that's just great podcast talk. Talk about the weather. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, look, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We have you featured in our issue 13, and it is really all about an exhibition that you have recently opened called Fuari Flores, which is such a mouthful. We've worked on it. I think I've got it down pat. You've done it really (laughs) well. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. And although it's audio, I'm hoping that if someone's listening to the podcast, please go to our Instagram and have a look at some of this artwork because it is incredible. It's multi-sensory and we'll get into what that means. But you had your official opening uh, just only a week ago. Do you want to tell me a little bit about, you know, what it was like in terms of your feelings, getting ready for it, the types of people that attended? Yeah, uh, it was such a magical experience. I think when you prepare for a solo exhibition, it is it is quite different emotionally to a group exhibition because there is a lot of pressure on you, obviously. And this show, you know, I've only been back in my home region for around two years uh, and I've been very quiet during that time. So I was actually expecting a really modest turnout, uh, but people came from far afield to the opening event Um, So we had over 100 people and some people had travelled hours and hours to get there, out from Gundawindi in, from across the coast to come inland to Toowoomba. Uh, So it was very moving and emotive for me um, and a really fantastic turnout as well and support from the councillors and mayor of Toowoomba Regional Council. I think, you know, an opening like that, you're bound to get caught up in stories with people and... I was really fortunate to have a lot of uh, previous workshop participants, I I do uh, professional development for artists, come along and um, help me re-fall in love with my own show, (laughs) which sounds really strange. Uh, But I teach exhibition storytelling. Uh, So to share that with everyone there um, through a floor talk and then one-on-one chats was such a great experience and something that I've never had with a solo exhibition. And you've done more than one exhibition too. Would this be your biggest? Oh, it's 
hard to say. It's definitely my biggest body of work. In the past, uh, a lot of my work was mainly based around interactive technologies and I exhibited, I guess, in larger venues and internationally. But this, I think, is more meaningful to me personally, this um, body of work. But it's also a much longer project. You know, I've been working on this project since 2017. So it's the culmination of many years of work. Now, this is the tricky one. Which segue, which lane to take right now? Do we go back to just 2017 and like how this exhibition came about? Oh, but I'm thinking we might go back a little further and tell me about Cara Ann growing up and how you've come to be an artist and, and if there's any influences you've noticed like have formed who you are today. Oh, that's a big question. Oh, Cara Ann growing up, oh, she was a wild child. Um, I caused my parents a lot of difficulties as a young child, wandering off down the paddock and having to have the SES out to try and search for me. Sure, my parents have many stories about that sort of thing happening. Uh, And I, you know, this is where I grew up. I grew up on this amazing property and rode horses every day. That was one of my biggest passions. And uh, it, I think it helped me fall in love with the land here. You know, this amazing eucalyptus forest that we have in different patches of the property and then these open paddocks. And um, some of my fondest memories growing up are galloping my wonderful pony who only passed away last year at the age of 37. So we grew up together. I got him when I was, I think, six. And we just had this amazing bond. And I think through him, I actually realised how much I love plants and I love being in the bush. And then I never set out to do art. I uh, set out to do law and political science. I, I wanted to work in federal policy, of all things, very dry. But I took a gap. 18 months and travelled Australia. Working, I um, picked tobacco in Myrtleford. I pruned grapevines down there as well and I pearl farmed up in Broome. Uh, in Broome, I ran out of money and I uh, had to figure out a way. It was wet season, so I couldn't go anywhere. I was stuck in Broome. I had to figure out a way to pay for my board and food and I ended up painting murals for the backpackers I was living at and realised that I actually enjoyed doing that, that maybe I wasn't as bad at art as I had thought in high school. Uh, And I also had a film SLR camera that my parents gave me for my 18th. And I'd been documenting my trip. Uh, So that's how I got into uni. My mum actually enrolled me. She said it was time for me to come back to Queensland and get serious about study. And she told me she'd already set up a interview and I just had to turn up with a portfolio. Uh, and I thought, why not? I might as well give it a go. And I was accepted at the interview and started university the next week. So that's how it all unfolded in a very strange but organic way. And University of Southern Queensland, where I did my undergrad, was the perfect fit for me. At the time, it was a very 50-50 split degree where it was 50% practical and 50% theoretical. Uh, And that rigorous research side of it really fit my analytical personality. And I was very heavily conceptual, you know, doing silly things like performance art, (laughs) making artwork that was text-based, like this is text on glass on a wall, stuff that it can be a one-liner, but uh, it is derived from the conceptual art movement from the 60s. And that really influenced, I think, where my career headed after university as well. Like concept development is still really important to the way I develop artwork. I'm not really a fluid creator. I'm a very analytical creator. Looking back, are you happy that you took that arts degree path? I mean, it sounds so suited to you and obviously your mum had seen that in you versus law and political science. Definitely this is a career path that suited for me and somewhat ironically, I'm actually doing my Juris Doctor now. Um, So I've returned to law, definitely not to political science. I think, you know, having a career as a full-time artist is very hard and when I finished, I ended up in Melbourne 
uh, working for uh, Bundora Home Sit Art Centre, which is the city of Darabin, and worked my way up into being the curator. And then I actually shifted to cultural heritage and managed properties for the National Trust and then the Keith and Elizabeth Murdoch Trust. And my art degree actually really helped me with mainly problem-solving skills, but also research and analytical skills there. Uh, so, you know, I think a visual arts degree can be so much more than just being an artist. And in all of those roles, it was interesting that law and legal issues became a really big part, which is why I've come sort of full circle back to law uh, while having a full-time career as an artist as well. Uh, it's a really nice balance for me. I think law is such an interesting area once you move past, I think, some of the dryness, like the history of law in Australia is really fascinating and actually links into creativity really well. It's as if you read my mind. One of the questions I was going to ask, how do you make a career out of being an artist? Is it easy? Are there opportunities? Not knowing what an arts degree can open up for you, but obviously for yourself, you've had some amazing opportunities. Yeah, I think I've really lucked out in a lot of ways and, and worked very hard, <laughs> uh, sometimes to my own detriment. But I think an arts degree is to pursue it just for the purpose of having a full-time visual arts profession is really difficult. And, you know, we're sort of told, and I'm sure they still tell students when you come through that, you know, only 1% to 2% of your peers will end up making it as professional artists. And certainly in my class, that's fairly accurate. Uh, but those artists who have made it are actually having incredible careers. Uh, and it's amazing to watch them go from strength to strength. But most of them also have arts worker or alternative careers that supplement their income. They, they're still not, you know, we're all in our late 30s now and we're still not earning enough money from our visual arts careers uh, to solely rely on that as our only income, and particularly not from selling art. You know, a lot of us are consultants or workshop providers uh, or have a profession that's arts aligned or cultural heritage aligned um, to fit in. So it's, it's definitely not a straightforward career for most of us becoming professional artists, but I think there's potential there for it to shift into that and part of that is Australia's culture too in the arts you know there's a lot of investment in arts organizations but not necessarily in individual artists and so we you know have to supplement through grant applications or other jobs to help us make what we want to make. Yeah, it's not for the faint-hearted, that's for sure. We had had a little chat before we'd started the podcast uh, and you had mentioned that the industry is really female heavy. In the arts, there are a lot of women who are attracted to uh, different elements, you know, whether that's in art practitioner, so making art or arts administration or curation. Uh, I think though it's still really evident that while there is a huge number of women working in the arts, it's still very dominated in terms of the heavy hitters by men. It is a changing landscape. I am excited at some of the changes where women are starting to enter more executive roles beyond, uh, say, local council galleries. You know, we're looking at our state and our national galleries and museums where women are starting to get up into those executive roles. But on the whole, in my experience, a lot of those roles are still filled by men. Uh, and, you know, we've had that Know My Name kind of exhibition series and a whole lot of exhibitions that have come out from that focus on recognising women through Australian art history. And hopefully we're going to see a lot more of that recognising women who are working in the contemporary field as well. And uh, that's something, you know, I think we just have to be a bit more patient on to see those exhibitions come to fruition at those larger institutions. 
It's such an interesting insight. Uh, as you said, lots of females in the industry, but not at that high enough level, which is, you know, what we need. We need women at the table in those decision making roles. And, you know, the only way to do it is to keep pushing forward. Uh, and sometimes it does take really brave women and being comfortable with not being liked if you are going to make that transition sometimes, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, to step up and, um, you know, become a leader in the industry, you you do have to push past that uncomfortable barrier of making the tough decisions and knowing that you might be divisive in the community. Even, you know, at a local level, that's something that I've experienced working for local government um, and having to make tough decisions that I know will divide the community but are for the you know the long-term benefit and it is it is a really tough position to be in so you know I really have a lot of awe I think and admiration for those women who step up uh, at that more institutional or larger level to say you know they do want to be leaders and they are more than equipped to do it, uh, it's just a matter of changing the, the cultural landscape of the institution. Do you love the idea of taking the hard work out of shopping, knowing that someone else has curated for you endless apparel and homewares options that are high quality, often handmade and always beautiful? At Vivian Kate, the focus is on natural fibres and a timeless earthy style. You'll find high quality clothing in classic styles, unique homewares such as cow hides and handmade ceramics, gorgeous aromatherapy based skin and body products, and so much more. Personally, I love the selection of jewelry. Karen from Vivian Kate is all about connection and understanding what you need, and she offers a personal styling service by appointment. Karen loves to support other regional women in business and has a wide network of talented friends from all over the country, whose work she stocks in store in the beautiful regional town of Yakandanda in northeast Victoria. The Vivian Kate website mirrors the charm of the bricks and mortar store, ensuring you can access the same carefully selected items with just a click. Find out more by visiting www.viviankate.com or check out our show notes for links. In 2017, you spent almost a year in hospital with a severe brain infection. Did you want to take me back to that period? Because from that time, something wonderful has come out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is, I mean, it's a really tough story uh, to, to relive, but it's also an important story for me and for other people who have gone through similar things to know that they're not alone. I was really at what I thought was the peak of my career. I was the director of Cruden Farm, which is the garden estate for Dame Elizabeth Murdoch's property. Um, it was an amazing job. But I really loved it and I could really see myself in that role for a very long time. And I sort of had shelved my creative practice to focus on the job. And I suddenly got very sick. I was admitted to hospital. And as you said, I ended up uh, finding out I had a very severe brain infection. And at the end of over 11 months in hospital, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and another neurodegenerative condition called neurosarcoidosis. It was, I think, a really challenging diagnosis to hear because you sort of think a brain infection or like an infection of any type is something that you can usually recover from. But then to get like the double whammy of that kind of diagnosis is a shock. Uh, I had to do a lot of rehab and uh, I'd lost the ability to walk and also speak clearly. So I went into uh, a rehabilitation centre in Melbourne for a few months. And there um, my partner came up almost daily and he, I think he knew how much I loved plants. We'd only been going out when I got sick. We'd only been going out for about six months, so... He's an amazing person, very lucky to have him. Uh, and he would take me into the gardens there and encourage me to steal flowers from the rehab centre gardens and I'd take them back into my uh, hospital room and arrange them in plastic cups. Uh, I started photographing them on my phone and when I got home, I had to do walking every day for rehab and uh, I started stealing my neighbour's garden plants, just little flowers here and there. 
Uh, so I wasn't too cheeky about it. Uh, sometimes I'd steal them while I was talking to them and they, they were fully aware. I don't feel too guilty about it. <laughs> but I, I set up uh, my first um, little studio coming out of that was um, in our spare room wardrobe. So it was very small, very modest. And um, I bought some black velvet and photographed on black velvet. And that was really the start of Fiore Florence, which is Latin for stealing flowers. Uh, so that's yeah, really where the series started. That's on show at the moment. But also it was how I think I, I saved myself from you know, what was really traumatic. And um, I did very much have a mental health breakdown uh, so, you know, Flowers, my partner, and my beautiful dog were my sort of, um, my beacons of hope, I guess, in a very cheesy way of thinking about it, but they are what got me through it. And it actually gave me this wonderful opportunity to sit back, review my life and go, what would actually make me happy? You know, I, I have to deal with these illnesses now and, and know that they're going to progress what do I actually want for the rest of my life? And that's not sitting behind a desk every day. That's actually being creative and working with my community when I can and enjoying nature because that is, um, you know, a big part, I think, of my well-being is actually getting back into nature. What an incredible person Michael is. You have definitely found someone special there. In terms of MS, did you have to do a lot of research into that? Was that something that you knew a little bit about or, you know, have you really had to dive in or have chosen not to go too far into it? Oh, no, I've definitely dived in. Uh, It's something, you know, a lot of uh, specialists are very reluctant to give you too much information. I think they don't want to scare you too much. So I, I had a little bit of information from my specialists in Melbourne and then I really dived into ResearchGate and read all sorts of studies and uh, articles about MS. One of my favourite articles was actually uh, about the study of lion's mane, which is a medicinal mushroom on MS. And um, that is still a study that I come back to and... Um, has for me personally, has really helped me. Uh, So yes, I've very much dived into the research side of it. And um, the first series that I actually exhibited after diagnosis was a series of MRIs of my own brain with sound waves and thinking about how many people in Australia are not just affected by MS, but are affected by uh, a disability in some way. So your diagnosis and even looking at those brain scans, has that influenced your art in any way? Yeah, it definitely has. I think um, doing the small series about my brain scans and exhibiting them, it was almost like a confirmation that I still had creative skills, as as silly as that sounds. I I think I was so, um, I'd lost so much of my confidence that this little series, and it's only three works, was this massive stepping stone in me wanting to be more ambitious and starting to take the photographic flower works and turn them into something much more significant. Um, So those brain scans, which, you know, are because of my diagnosis, really were the instigator for going, no, no, I can have a career and... I can make it what I want it to be, which is, you know, to be a professional artist and to try and focus on building that full time as my main career. Uh, So, you know, in some ways it actually, as traumatic as that whole experience was, it's actually been really beneficial for me too. And you just mentioned that they were three works, so very small, but really significant. There's almost a little life lesson in that as well, isn't it? That, you know, we don't have to do big things to get a big result. Uh, Sometimes it's just those tiny but mighty steps. Yeah, absolutely. And that's sort of, I think, been my whole recovery journey 
is sometimes you feel like you're, you know, one step forward, half a step back, but you're still making progress even if it's minute and you only realise that after you are a few years in and you think, no, I actually, I can't believe how far I've come on that journey. What are your days like, Cara Ann? Do you have more good days than bad days? I do. I um, think especially, you know, I've been back here in the family farm for a bit over two years and moving back here, my health has improved, which is really wonderful. And most days of the year, I don't have to use any walking aids, which is feels like a miracle in some ways. And I spend, you know, I get up early and go for my morning walk um, before the heat hits. And I think that's really good medicine, you know, getting into the bush, soaking in that sensory environment and just taking life as it comes. But alongside all of that, I'm so busy too. I uh, facilitate workshops for flying arts in Queensland and I've taken on a few commissions and I'm making a lot of art. Uh, So it's been the very rich, fulfilling couple of years since I've made the the transition back to home. You had mentioned at the start that you were living in your parents' shearing shed. Now, I'm assuming that that has been renovated (laughs) and, (laughs) you know, its um, other occupants have been vacated. Could you just tell us a little bit about living in a shearing shed? There has got to be thousands of people that have unused shearing sheds on their properties This whole idea that you could probably transform it and renovate it into something else, I think is even another podcast episode, my gosh. Oh, look, it is is wonderful. I love, absolutely love living there. When I moved back home for university, uh, my parents really wanted me to stay on the farm but wanted to give me independence and space. Uh, So many years ago, (laughs) we converted our shearing shed, which was still a working shearing shed uh, at the time. Uh, into a livable building. Um, So it's lined with corrugated iron, but it still has some of the exposed beams. And part of it's actually lined with our uh, sheep's wool, uh, which is a really nice sort of memory for me, knowing that um, part of the farm will always be in the wool. And the first couple of years, my dad sort of said, that he'd still like to use it as a shearing shed when he had to do. We'd really downsized our uh, sheep. By then we mostly had cattle, but he still had a small herd of sheep. And he wanted to continue using it as a shearing shed when I lived there, which I didn't really have a problem with, but my mum did, which is good in a way because looking back now, I, I sort of was, a, you know, not so worried about hygiene, but the shearing area was in my kitchen. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> So I am glad that we ended up finding an alternative for dad. <laughs> uh, yes, it's um, not multi-purpose. I can't imagine, yeah, the sheep, once they're shorn, they're penned in your bedroom or something. And just, yeah, I mean, you've got to make, there's got to be a line where it's like, yeah, we're not using this shed from here That's on in. It. That's it. So we did, we did draw the line. <laughs> um, but coming back and living there, it's such a great building. You know, I've got a little eco toilet, which is, I I will rave about it to everyone. I think it's such a brilliant idea and great for rural properties. And, you know, we, we're on bore water, so I've got my little water pump and it is the perfect dwelling for two people. It's just the right size for us. We, you know, have to, I'm a collector, so that has been the only difficulty is letting go of some of my antique furniture so that we could fit in there. But I did achieve that and now we have the most delightful, wonderful space to live in. Oh, it just sounds it sounds so Pinterest, like it's just perfect <laughs> well, my for sister, that. My <laughs> she's just moved up uh, to the region as well. Um, they've bought a farm about 20 minutes from our place and they've just been renovating their barn as well. So there's more to come. Oh, exciting. Well, I hope that you're sharing some images on socials or somewhere that we can follow along. 
Now, just one of the lines in your article that comes up a bit is that you are a multi-sensory artist. What does that actually mean? Uh, well, it is multiple senses. So um, for me in my practice at the moment, that means sight, sound, touch and smell. Uh, so I make visual artworks, which are both 2D works and video works. I also make tactile works uh, in the show that's currently on. That includes fabric drops, a hand-woven rug, bean bags, but also some of my sculptures are quite tactile. And then smell and sound. And sound for this particular show is in primarily the videos, and that's a lot of field recordings. So uh, sounds of the environment and the smells. Last year, I was very lucky to uh, do a short course with the Institute of Art and Olfaction. Um, so I did that remotely. Uh, they're based in LA. And through that, I sort of gained skills in perfumery that I was able to apply to my practice. So I custom create scents that reflect different elements of the environmental plants. So one of my favourite smells in the world is the smell of petrichor, which is the smell of rain on earth. And I'm sure many people will recognise that smell. It's actually unique to the site. Um, so here on the site where I am at the moment, when you smell petrichor, it's actually infused with uh, eucalyptus oils but also the earth is rich in iron, so you do get a slightly metallic smell with it as well. I love that detail of knowing a smell like that um, is going to be different for everyone who experiences it, but there'll be a similarity that they can still relate to. Oh, my gosh. You are like a genius, Karan. My biggest wish one day is that I could infuse the pages of the magazine with a scent to add you know, just another layer to that tangible experience. Your paper has the most beautiful smell already. It's that, like, I cracked it open and I flicked through the pages and it was that hot off the press smell and I actually I actually did bury my nose in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got an ink smell, absolutely. For you, what is your outlook for this year? You know, I mean, I'm assuming that health is always the priority for you, but is there something else that you're hoping to achieve or that, you want to get out of the next 12 months? Well, it's a big one. Uh, definitely help. Um, but also this exhibition, having it come together and, and seeing it set up in the gallery has cemented my ambition to get it touring. Um, so, you know, most galleries plan a minimum 12 to 24 months ahead. So that gives me this year to get it packaged and start reaching out to program from 2025 onwards. Uh, so that is definitely on my mind at the moment, which also means a lot more funding applications are probably headed my way. And getting back to my law degree as well, uh, I took a, a leave of absence for part of last year. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to that on a very part-time basis. Bendigo is very well renowned for its art gallery here. It would be amazing to have you come down south and, you know, to see something like this in person. But obviously if anyone is anywhere uh, near Toowoomba, specifically the University of Southern Queensland Art Gallery, my gosh, if you're anywhere there between Jan 8 and Feb 16, you need to, to see it for sure. Just to wrap us up, Cara Ann, do you have a friend of yours that we need to know about? Too many, but I've narrowed it down to two. The first one is a very dear friend of mine, Nicole Jenkins. That's J-A-K-I-N-S. And Nick is the most fabulous artist, but also an extraordinary jeweller. Uh, she's based in the Wide Bay region and she makes really exquisite earrings primarily out of recycled metals and using Australian flora and fauna as her inspiration. She is someone who is very much remarkable and her work is stocked um, in some major galleries around Australia, but she also has an online store. And my other friend is the marvellous Alex Stalling, who is someone I went through university with, has stayed in Toowoomba 
which I think is such a courageous thing to stay in your hometown uh, and forge a career uh, regionally. And she has created a business called Tinker, which runs workshops primarily for children, but also a lot of adult workshops as well. And it is an amazing program. So for children, she enrolls them in uh, term classes and you can absolutely see the progress and the freedom that her students gain uh, each term as they develop their creative skills. But they also start thinking about creativity in a way that's outside of our educational system. Um, so, yeah, definitely, you know, if you've got children uh, in and around Toowoomba, definitely uh, consider enrolling them in the Tinker School. Amazing friends of yours that we can look up and, of course, I'll include those in the show notes as well, along with the details to see your exhibition and and just experience the other pieces of absolute magic that you create. I want to say a really big thank you for being a guest, for sharing your story and for a multi-sensory experience. It's amazing. Oh, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you and so lovely to connect with Oak Magazine as well. Now, before you take off with all that inspiration and knowledge, we'd love for you to leave a review on our podcast so that we can continue to amplify women's voices in the media. And if you have any questions, we'd like to celebrate a win. You can always connect with us on Facebook and Instagram at Oak Magazine AU. I'm so glad we've met and that now you know a friend of mine.